Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, it seemed like they kind of build on each other as we go here. Yes, so. and there was a lot of reorganization in this section. Yeah, I'll say like in, in general, most of them I had no. Most of them were. Fine. I didn't yeah, really see much of, of anything. Okay. So if you still want to continue down each one in case. Just say yes. Yeah, we can just okay. do that. All right. Um, Two hundred one admission of students, um, same first grade and kindergarten. Yep. Okay. 202, eligibility of non-resident students. Yep. Okay, 203 is a new policy, immunizations and communicable diseases. And surprisingly, I've got nothing on that. <laughs> the only so. question I had, the only question I had, this comes more because it might be work, but I wondered if there were further requirements around storage and security of health records because it's personal health information. Mm. Um, I would think that there'd be more references we need to tag, but I don't know the references, so if they're comprehensive enough, that, that's fine. Yeah. But um, um, I just thought that there would be more. I wonder if a records policy is where that's captured too. Okay. Yeah, not in this one, but it's right. Right. in some of the, the subsequent ones, there seems to be a little bit more on records. Yeah. I think that's right. Okay, that's fine. The other way, there's nothing wrong with what this is. It just it was lacking some, some of that that I thought we might need. But if it's somewhere else, the only, no. that's put my button. Yeah, there's people on the line. Yeah. Not many. The, the only question I had, and it's not really any specific wording, but the top of page two, the about homeless students. Who have not been immunized or unable to provide uh, shall be admitted in accordance with the provisions. But yeah, that's. I know that references the homeless students section, which we'll see later. But yes. it seems like if we go through all of later on in other policies, we talk about this has to be in by this date, this, this, this. And then this seems like it's really wide open. Very much so. Homeless students are uh, protected by the McKinney Vent Vento Act. Okay. So. That's fine. Uh, 203.1, um, so our previous 203.1 was uh, replaced, universal precautions, communicable diseases, and some of this was combined. So 203.1 is HIV infection. Uh, updated confidentiality language and compliance with the Pennsylvania confidentiality of HIV related information. Just why, why is that needed? The entire policy and why is HIV singled out? That's a good question. I'm looking at the notes to see if they. I mean, you think about everything that's out there, why it just seems prejudicial to me. It was probably because back a million, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't actually, you know, it was a concern on how um, students were um, having so. I can check with our solicitor. Yeah, I would just, you know, scroll through. And, and then the other question, which kind of ties into that, the last sentence on page one, it said, go to principals shall notify parents about the current board policies concerning that. So it just seems, you know, does that happen in the handbook? Like why specifically say they need to be notified? There's no, there's no school code or anything that's, that yeah. is um, attached to that. I would think that notification would be in the handbook. Right, be the handbook. That's what I'm and if it's not in the handbook, I'm not sure what the you know, what the point is, but yeah. that would just be the question I'm asking the same thing. Then my favorite policy is the deleted one. <laughs> deleted. Which one? Oh, two of Three, two, three point one. Oh yeah, this was the universal yeah, yeah. precautions. Right. Deleted. Okay. 
um, 204 attendance. <laughs> this went through a lot of revisions with PSBA because there had been um, a good bit of changes to school code. <laughs> So my favorite of this is the top of page five. All absences behind beyond 10 days will require an excuse from a licensed practitioner of the healing arts. Yeah. Like, okay. I mean, in every other policy, we'd like list every medical you know, physician, a practitioner of the healing arts. I, I have no idea what that is. I know the intent, but I... I, I would need to ask as well. I'm, is that language specific to school code or? Yeah, I don't, it, um, these or, are the current PSBA templates. Right, this is, yeah. this is the current PSBA template. So maybe that's their global way of saying that a licensed medical doctor can write the note, a, a psychologist can write the note, a therapist can write the note. I, I'm seeing nods out there. Yeah, the absolutely. Services. Services. Well, that's, that's um, any type of approval necessary for whether it's the orthodontist or a therapist or um, an orthopedist, just someone that's able to say, yeah, this, this is this is the care that the child was under, and then the school district has local discretion to accept that as, as acceptable. It, I mean, it makes sense. I, I knew. I know what they're, they're going for. Just it's a it, terrible word. It, it, it is. It's, 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 I'm not sure what. And coming right, from the SBA too, it's like. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's choosing both in person yeah. and virtual. Okay. I guess okay. the other similar uh, wording issue that jumped out to me is the person in parental relation. I mean, it, it, I, it doesn't bother me at all, but it seems like everywhere else we just say parent slash guardian. Yeah. Maybe this needs to be more specific, but uh, that it, one jumped out at me. I'm could, fine with it. But. Yeah. It, I guess who has educational rights of the child? Sometimes that's a conversation that we have is, you know, we're identifying family members, especially in a custody agreement, who has the educational rights for the child who's permitted to write the note. That could be that workaround to provide some flexibility. The, uh, the ones that the questions that I had on this one were on the top of page three. There's a list of possible exclusions from mandatory school requirements. And uh, um, number like six, it says students 15 years of age as well as students 14 years of age who have completed the highest elementary grade, but if they're engaged in farm work or private domestic service, then they don't have to go to school. Like, do, do we want that? That's still part of school code. School code, I think I'm right. yes. But we have to allow that? It's part of school code, yes. Yep, school code. And I know that's a pretty antiquated statement that, yeah. you know, you would think when the compulsory attendance law was changed that right. People that would have would gone in and updated the rest of school code, but they didn't. They they left some of those pieces in place. So the state thinks that it's a path for success for students to leave at that age. That's what we're being told, right? Yes. Which is the language of the, the, the wording of it is odd. Students 15 years of age as well as students 14 years of age. How about just students? Pick an age 14, 14 and yeah. up. Like, yeah. Well, I guess you don't need, well, because 16 is different. Well, I think it could be 15 no matter where you are, but it's 14 and you have to have completed the highest right. elementary. Oh, okay, okay, so you as well. Okay, got it, got it, got it. But still, yeah. I would just get rid of the whole thing. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, we're yeah, requiring yeah. them, if we went from the age of eight to the age of six, yeah. right? <laughs> don't you think? Yeah. That's it says under duly issued permits, so I would think that would be in the superintendent's discretion. Yes. Um, the only other question I had, and this is just a, a just is in, in application on page five. Um, so when a student has been, it's, it's under student through another enforcement. When a student has been absent for three days 
without an excuse shall provide notice. Do we do that? Do we actually do that after three days? Okay, okay, we have three out of two that. Yes. Three, the kids have to uh, provide a note after three un unexcused days. Yes. Yeah. And then you get, and then that's when you're just saying, hey, hey folks, FYI. Okay. Yes, and then that's when the new state process starts up. Okay. The, the school attendance improvement plan that guarantees that a meeting must happen specifically for the attendance. Okay. So three is now that magic number. Is that three? Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Um, 205 is a new policy postgraduate students. Yeah. Short and sweet. Um, 206 is a new policy as well. Assignment within the district. Uh, would not necessarily be an issue for the Octorera Area School District because all of your schools are on one campus. So, but larger school districts, especially when they have to redistrict for attendance boundaries, um, that's where an assignment within the district policy would come in. And then the classroom part. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then the, the classroom piece would the classroom certainly piece. apply to us. Yeah. I was thinking of said I was reading that, but we don't, we don't need this. Yeah, it's the bottom part. Yeah. Yep, 207, confidential communications with students. This is a new policy. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, 208 withdrawal from school. Um, they added language regarding the new compulsory school wage uh, requirements that were effective this school year. Okay. Health examinations and screenings. Okay. Uh, replace the district's health services policy with PSBA policy guide on health examinations and screenings. Um, their concern is that our previous policy may have been out of date with current practice and um, state laws. So we have school nurse or medical technicians. So I'm assuming if we define what, what is a medical technician? <laughs> um, you know, that's a good question because it's not very often that a school district would hire a medical technician per right. se. Um, I'm not sure why we would have, I mean, we would have a school nurse. So unless Kale, you have some additional information there on your student services. So the medical technician doesn't necessarily apply or full meaning in this case, but in um, other features and functions of what a school nurse would typically do, they, they denote say a medical technician or a health room aide has the purview to conduct most nurse functions. So health screenings, BMI screenings, the scoliosis screening, um, hearing vision, all of those screenings can be um, performed by a, a medical technician or a health room aide. So basically any health designee that the district would say has a commensurate level of skill to perform it, then that person can. Um, it's somewhat vague, it's almost specifically vague, but you'll see in some of the other nursing um, pieces that come up, they, they talk about um, the various people that can perform functions, such as um, med, um, the distribution of medicine, um, overseeing students with diabetes, and um, glucose, glucagon, anything along those lines. So it allows for that to take place. So specifically though, in this policy, we are using the word medical technician as a true medical technician and not a designated health aide. Or are which, which line are you specifically looking at? I am under guidelines and it's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph down. So it's very specific, school nurse or medical technician. And so yeah, and this one, it can truly be anyone um, that we designate as that medical technician. 
technician. So it's not a licensed medical person. It doesn't, there, there's not a specific credential that it's speaking to. And I think we need to check because that's not what this is saying. And, yeah. and I think it also goes back to some challenges we've had in the past of having staff designated or told, you know, that, that are trained to take height and weight. We've had some issues in the past. I think we just need to be really clear on what we want to go to. Yeah, and I think that it, it ends up being a school code thing. Um, so we were recently looking at these on um, PA.gov, and they describe it as a medical technician or a health room aide as well, um, or it can be any teacher or member of the staff. You know, and, and being sensitive to the issues of the BMI screenings um, recently and, and, and what may have transpired and sensitivity to that. It's just that it gives the flexibility to go up to. How do we put that in there? Because it's um, like for example, if we were to uh, reach out to Penn Medicine, uh, you know, our, our school doctor, school physician, and ask for their assistance in anything, mm -hmm. that would then allow us to go beyond that of just being a school nurse, because right. those, those folks aren't necessarily hired by us as school nurses, or they're not credentialed as school nurses, but they can legally perform the, the duty. But if we wanted to go downward and say we just wanted to establish the staff member, could do it. We have to put it in there as school nurse or medical technician or, or staff designated. You know, I don't know that we want to do that. Well, who doesn't know? Like, it's a phys ed teacher. Like, what's the what's the operation? It's it's a school nurse. Was it the school nurse when we had the issue? I thought it was a phys ed teacher. When we had the issue last year, it was more of the location of where it occurred. But that was a school nurse? Too. No, school it, nurse too. it was. Um, was a teacher in the classroom and, and an aide. So under school code, they would have been okay to do them Correct. as long as they were in a secure, confidential environment. Part of the issue we had is that those screenings were happening in, in a classroom in front of kids. But I think you're asking the question, who do we want to allow to do that? Well, I'm just, I, I bet we, our, our policies become so specific, and this is one instance where it's not specific, that, you know, if I read it just as it is, I understand exactly what you're saying, but that's not, if I read it, it doesn't say designate of, you know, of the nurse, just as a medical technician. Now, if you put medical technician, then it's like, it is, it says, that it, word it, is, it says it or it does yeah, go, you know. Yeah, that put a definition in for what a medical technician is. is. It's someone who says, it's yeah. someone who says, right, as long as you have it, that it's specific, that it does, that somebody comes back and says, you know, a teacher did, you know, whatever, then it's okay. We're doing it correctly. That's all. Okay. Again, it's only because it's so specific about everything else. We can work on some language there to help with the second reading. And then I'm just, this is a curiosity question. I know you hate these questions. No, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. Okay, under, health, under health records, the very last paragraph, the district shall destroy student health records only after the student has not been enrolled in the district for at least two years. Mm -hmm. So do you shred them? Like you have a procedure, how you purge your files? Yeah, we would shred them. Um, and actually, um, the night of uh, commencement, uh -huh. um, it's part of the package that our students get from us. Uh -huh. Okay, we make sure all of that goes into their hands. Uh -huh. um, but anything, um, I think we would have a process in place to shred. I, I just assumed you did. I just thought it. Yeah. Let's go back to the more questions. So, is there a reason? I mean, if you give it to them for commencement, why do we have to have this in here that at least two years? In, in case the student doesn't pick pick it up that night. Gotcha. So, but they come back four years later and say, "Where's my record?" Or something shows up a week later. Right. Food allergy management. This is a new policy. Okay. Two oh nine point two diabetes management. Remember when we did this the first time? I did 
would not see anything. I don't know if anyone else saw anything. Yep. Um, 210 medications. Um, again, just as a curiosity question on page two, second paragraph, the policy of administration regulation shall be reviewed at least every two years. So is this, is this new or do we currently do this? I would hope that we do, but it's possible that we have it. Okay. Or that it's new. Or so I'm right. Sure. Okay. And, and my, my next question actually has to do with the net, both of these policies together, because in this policy, there's a, a sentence under guidelines about asthma inhalers and epinephrine auto injectors. And then we have a whole other policy specifically on that. Yeah. Um, which is not a bad, I just, you know, it just seems. Yeah, that there's a policy for that specific. And is that more, and that looks like it's also more for the epinephrine auto injectors than it is actually for the inhalers. They lump the two together. I mean, I'm fine with it. I just wanted to bring that up. 2010.1. Yeah, that's a, that's a new, that's that's a new, a new right. policy. And the, the other question, and it's also more for the 2010.1, but it's in both of them, but specifically with an inhaler, talks about you have to notify the nurse immediately after each occurrence. Is that really, I mean, isn't an inhaler pretty much? Like, it, it seems very specific to me, like with the number of kids who are using those, and I don't know what that number is, but they'd be constantly <laughs> notifying it. someone. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how you, thing. so even if they notify you, how do you manage that information? What do you do with it? Right. So I think it's just a matter of, they want to make sure the school nurse is aware of any health conditions that might be occurring to the students in the building. So, you know, if the students in my class can use their inhaler and I don't say much, and then they come to Jeff's class and use their inhaler, and then you know, they move to Matt's class and so on and so forth. But no one reports to the nurse. We as the district haven't done our due diligence to notify and say, you know, hey, Dr. Warner, your child's been in school. We've noticed they've used their inhaler seven times consecutively, uh, you know, across consecutive periods in a day, where the student might just say, oh, I think I'm supposed to do it. I feel like I should. So it allows for that, that opportunity to share the info. And so then I'm assuming when we when that when that person when that student brings the inhaler, that's part of the help of you know of the communication. Okay, we're gonna have this, but we use it. Correct. And, and, and it does get a little more specific. I believe it's in um, 210.1 where it goes on to talk about if the student's not able to self-administer properly, safely, or if they're you know in danger of mismanaging whatever that inhaler or, or um, that piece of medicine is, that the permission can be revoked. Um, so, you know, if the student doesn't have the ability to be safe with whatever that is, uh, the district has the right to take that privilege away, and then they'd have to go to the nurse. So, so within that, just just how it works out, again, and the same language, the, the student shall notify the nurse immediately following the use. If they're in the middle of class, does that mean, hey, I text the nurse, I email the nurse, I get up from the class and after class, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out the logistics back to Matt's question. Like, how does this really, I get the whole concept. Yeah, uh, it, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily spelled out and I don't believe that we have anything you know, procedurally spelled out for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be something that we could work with the nurses to see you know, if they would agree that there's a level of need for that procedure. That's all I had for that one. 211, uh, they recommended that we delete it. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, and then 212, reporting so, so the only questions I had on this under guidelines, um, second paragraph, student, parent, guardian shall receive ample warning 
it would be nice to define what, what ample learning is because that certainly would be very subjective, I would think. Perhaps could be. Absolutely. Um, and then I was just curious about the two then the next two paragraphs under that grade reports shall be issued at intervals of not less than nine weeks. Just what the point of that what, what the, I'm not saying get rid of it, I'm just curious of what well, I would say that language was probably in the previous policy that this uh, replaced because it looks like the only words they changed were grade and reports. So, so I would think that would be what, what the use of that suggested that I think ample isn't really telling us anything. Yeah, and those so, are and those nine weeks. What would you suggest if there's any suggestion of taking it out or changing it? Yeah, um, and those are conversations that we're having this year with the administration and the junior, junior, senior high as we work through their school improvement plan. You know, what's that master schedule going to look like? Um, you know, what what kind of grading and reporting are we going to use? Are we going to put the progress report scenario back in? I know um, something that I saw the administration push out this week, which I thought was really effective given the transition from hybrid to remote and remote and back is um, this uh, parent uh, prog progress or contact form now um, that you know there's a lot of work being done to make sure that that the teachers are on the front line of notifying mom and dad immediately when a child doesn't log in or when a child is only logging in at the beginning of the class and not staying in the class consistently um, you know really putting those processes those <coughs> contact forms in place those processes in place um, to uh, strengthen the communication at home. So it almost becomes like a weekly progress report that parents get, or a daily progress report, depending upon what students need to be successful. That sounds good. Um, 2.13, they recommended we delete, and that's assessment of student progress. Um, and then the last one was 214, which was class rank. Minor content revisions made throughout the policy for better clarity. School code is a wonderful thing, right? <laughs> uh, related to I noticed that uh, reading the rest of the pack, it's it's related to policy since we do want to bring it up just quick. The homework, um, the homework note that's in the uh, I think it's the sixth grade handbook. The, um, the homework says like uh, ten to twenty hours per grade, but our policy actually says ten. It doesn't give you the wiggle, so. The, um, the uh, where is it? I put a little note. Uh, it's on page 11. So it's in the elementary handbook? The policy says grade one is 10 minutes, not 10 to 20 minutes. Grade two is 20 minutes, not 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, we have like, we give ranges in the handbook. Okay. So the policy is more like, you know, policy was written 10 minutes per grade level. So like, yeah. You had in eighth grade, you should have 80 minutes of homework max. That's sort of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the intent. Yeah. All right. And um the handbook just Elena, gives do, you, do you want to work with the elementary? It's not a big thing. To look at that. It's just you just gotta delete one one line. It's well, on and it's on page eleven. That's assuming that we're going by way of the policy handbook. Right. No, the, our policy, our board policy. Our board policy is specific. Our, when did we I mean have we, I thought we just did that for policy, too. Yeah. Okay. So we're happy with the policy. I'm saying I know they don't connect, but they're, they're not. Oh, uh, which one do you want to change? Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm asking. Now, they're, they're not aligning, yeah. but I'm not. Yeah. doesn't mean we have to change the handbook one. Yeah, but you've got to change one. I 
One other note, uh, Elena on page four. Um, there's a paragraph that says, uh, flag salute and pledge of allegiance. That students have the right to decline recitation of those. That, that can be taken out because it's already given um, on a prior page. So you could, just, you could just look, it just cleans it up. It takes out the duplication. Is there, if, if there's a question in the chat, is that a correct way to address? Or do they have to zoom in? See, I didn't look at the chat. Oh, all right. I received a text that there was a question in the chat. Um, we'll just capture it and try to address that. For okay. Joey, can we get a copy of the chat? So should I tell the parent to zoom in next? For the next meeting. Well, we're gonna. No, I think we'll have. It. I'm gonna get a copy of the chat, sure. and, okay. and I'll reach out and, okay. and answer the question. Great. Thank you. Uh, facilities are next. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so on the agenda tonight, um, uh, under other, uh, we wanted to bring uh, all house in just to give us a uh, status of uh, state of the union kind of uh, uh, presentation of transportation this year. We, we did this last year, um, maybe a little bit earlier, I think in October, when we thought that would be a good time to bring them in. So, had some in-person and some online uh, uh, learning going on. So uh, we've asked them to come and give us a quick update. Our pleasure. Thank you for inviting us, first of all. Can everybody hear me okay? You need to get on the, the Zoom, though, because we have them. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sidebar I was preparing this today I thought maybe I ought to write on saddle or on a paper and hand it to you because that's kind of where transportation's been but that's kind of where everything's been but uh, regardless for that little funny there um, we're tra currently transporting 2,483 students on our roster that's across all programs that we look forward to transport to of which nine of those students are homeless um, and they're coming out of Coatesville, Quarryville, and West Grove, those three locations. We're currently transporting to 37 different student programs. And um, currently out of those 37 programs, 26 of those programs are in session being face-to-face. -face. 
three are face-to-face -face four days per week, and eight are in session, but they're virtual. That's across all 37 programs. I thought you'd find that interesting. We're traveling to 23 different zip codes. I think probably our furthest destination is probably Phoenixville and Lancaster. Um, we have 205 different bus routes in our computer system which I think is probably close to being a record, but you have to understand that when schools go virtual, we have to have ways to get tech kids to tech or run in a run for that instead of shuttles and so on and so forth. And so you go to our database and look what runs, there's 205 different scenarios in there for the vehicles that we're running. As far as contracted vehicle total goes, we're at, we're at standing at 49. Uh, 29 72 passenger buses, three 48 passenger buses, and three 24 passenger vehicles. Uh, those last three are also handicapped vans. They have lifts in them for wheelchairs, etc. Um, we're running 14 nine passenger school vehicles for the total of 49. Um, during the week of November 9th and the 16th, we had our drivers keep track of percentage of ridership across the board here at Dr. Rare. And unfortunately, we only got the 11-9 week was the only week of high school that we had in session. We planned for a two-week uh, snapshot of that, and then we unfortunately, the high school stopped on that second week. But anyway, to get to that, our junior-senior high school morning routes were seeing a 24.1% ridership out of the total. And in the afternoon, that same group was 25.1%. Jumping over to elementary now, we were able to do those for the two weeks of the 9th and the 16th of November. The elementary ridership was almost double. The morning runs looked at, we looked at 43.9% and in the afternoon, 47.7% ridership there. Um, we currently have 31 vehicles with video cameras in them. That was part of our contract, current contract that we're in. And beginning with the 21-22 school year coming up, we will have 80% in, and then the 22-23 school year, we'll have 100% in like our agreement um, dictated. Um, we're somewhat surprised at uh, the number of requests we've gotten for uh, video, which has been rather low. But remember one thing, our discipline uh, issues right now during this current school years have been minimal at best. So I'm sure that helps throw it off a little bit. Um, do you have any questions or comments? That's a quick snapshot of what we're doing right now. And if I miss something or if you got questions, throw them my way or Lynn's way. I brought Lynn away be, uh, along because she's the rap guru. <laughs> so um, we're, of course, with tech, um, some of the private schools. Like I said before, it's, it's, a, it's a moving target because we're trying to provide transportation where we can. Where we had shuttles, we can't shuttle because we're not utilizing that transportation at present, um, but we're ready to go back to that if and when that happens, so. We do um, have actually have, um, I think we determined there's 11 programs or vehicles that haven't skipped a beat. They've gone the days that they've been scheduled to go. And Scott and I actually met with Jeff last week and went through and, and determined how many days it was scheduled, how many days it actually went. Um, and I think it was it was an eye opener on both sides to see what, what's working, what's not, what is going, what's not. Any questions? Well, that, that is actually very interesting. I, I think sometimes when, when folks think about transportation, they don't realize the intricacies of the fact that we have to transport so many um, of our district children that actually are not attending our schools. And you know, even the ones that, you know, that, that just how wide spread it is, and it's it's a cost, but we have to incur it because we transport everyone. So that was actually very interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, real quick, um, could you just uh, talk about the non-public uh, schools and um, uh, just to let the board know, you know that we've been doing some uh, very new legislation out there that doesn't require us to do all the non-public 
transportation. <laughs> we did it last year. We had to do it this year, regardless of being open or closed. Mm -hmm. So that basically is what we're going to talk about now. Probably mm -hmm. not really. We're just. Um, I think what Jeff's referring to, there has been some dialogue that non-pubs didn't necessarily have to, they had to go by operator's calendar, correct, Jeff? Uh, and that's still, but, and not their own, but they go by their own calendar and we have to provide transportation. That's, that's the basic way of looking at it. Um, so we're providing that transportation according to their calendar. And then, uh, just a matter of reference, we actually even have one school that last year was in session Christmas Eve day, and they did it again. So we'll be transporting on Christmas Eve day <laughs> again, because we are required to transport according to their calendar. So we try to do this cold. Um, we have seen some light duty as far as attendance goes at some of the non-publics, uh, because those, some of those students have gone virtual. Uh, and they, and they had that offering for their students as well. Um, we did not run a percentage there because a lot of the a lot of the non-public uh, transportation is at, at I don't want to say maximum, but it's their maximum utilization of the transportation that's offered to them. How does that um, percentage of ridership affect reimbursement rates at all? So, so for 21-22, they're going to uh, try to keep us a whole harmless because they know those numbers are way down. Um, we're trying to keep the numbers down due to social distancing. So um, if your numbers are down, your minimum reimbursement next year will be close to what your amount was this year. So PD does realize that with those numbers way down, when you do your average and your formula, your reimbursement could be hundreds of thousands less. So they're trying to keep us uh, level funded uh, as, uh, as opposed to using that formula. Now schools can opt in to use the formula. There might be some that might be better with the formula. But, so that's good news. We just heard that last week. So these numbers that you hear when we do the eight month average of the ridership, they'll be really low. That won't be used in the calculation. So our so when we go to budget, we're going to budget a very, very comparable number to what we use this year for transportation. And, and Jeff, when they do that calculation, it's actually uh, figured in the past. I'm assuming it would be the same on the maximum number of students assigned to that particular bus, correct? Well, it's uh they use the maximum number, yeah. but then we have the but we have an eight month average. Gotcha. So we take that. Several right. readings, Scott takes several readings. We look at them, we'll take the highest. So, just a quick question to find out how our students have been on the bus this year, given that they have to wear a mask and there's some assigned seating going on, and it may not be the same bus ride they've had in the past. I would have to say, um, from what the drivers have reported, I believe we've only had three incidents where. Students had to be reminded more than once about wearing a mask, and the principals involved um, took care of that, and it, it corrected itself. Or basically, what they were told was, "You either mask up or you can't ride." So um, they, they came down just as they as we expected they would, and so that was that was good. Um, with the ridership being down, we are able to not have the three to a seat um, starting buses, so that um, we are not six feet apart because then you would only fit eight in a 72 passenger bus by doing that. That's not really cost effective to the district. But however, the students are, they're being very cooperative. Um, I think we've only had maybe two discipline issues and they are, they're students that we would have had issues anyway um, and they, they can't help it. So we do have some of those. Thank you. I think overall, as far as student behavior goes and then accommodating the changes i think it's been outstanding um, very very few issues that way and i don't believe the i don't believe we've taken a phone call from a parent saying that johnny's not wearing the mask we haven't taken any of those we anticipated some about none that's great 
I believe Michelle and I had one. <laughs> oh, you met that. Yeah, that was. And that was that was from my. Uh, that was a private school. Yes, yeah, it was. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always fun when you get the follow-up phone call from the elected official for that area. <laughs> yeah. So and that, that student is now wearing a mask. Awesome. Yes. That, that was a good conversation. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, just so you know, along the same lines with cleaning our equipment, that type, type of thing, um, they're being cleaned on a regular basis. The drivers have disinfectant spray. They're wiping down the high touch areas. Uh, we're opening windows for ventilation when it was possible when it's not freezing cold out because the air circulation is, is, uh, is paramount as far as getting the air moving in the vehicle. Uh, and as Lynn said, we're separating kids as best we can in the bus, unless they're in the same family or live in the same household, that type of thing. We're trying to do our best that way, too. Any other questions? You, could... you know we're always open to phone calls. Yes, anytime you want to know something, please let us know. We're here to serve the district and you folks. And uh, if you've got questions, we're, we're there for you. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing I have on the agenda is a water testing update. So last time we met, I explained that um, in December we were going to be doing uh, our next round of water testing. We we're going to have to do four samples for each building. We have a total of 20. Um, we moved up that testing a little bit so that we could get it in uh, between that meeting and this meeting. We did the, the samples and we got the results back. Um, and we have, out of the 20 samples, we have no samples at a level that is considered um, uh, having to take action. So, lead and copper, right? Yeah, lead and copper. I'm sorry, what? Lead and copper. Yeah, lead and copper. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So that's lead and copper testing. If you have any results with the uh, lead uh, testing of 15 parts per billion or higher, then that means that you have to do additional testing, look at, you know, why would you have that result? We have none. So that's good news. Um, we, are reporting this information to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and they will get back with us uh, for the next steps. Uh, you know, do we just continue uh, sampling annually, or do we have other steps for us to do? Because we did have some higher ratings in the past. So we'll let the committee know that that's good news. With the, uh, since we're not using the buildings as much now, right, um, are we running taps? Just so that we keep water, like fresh water, flowing through the system. About running staff and buildings that definitely don't have any kids in. Are we running, are we running taps in the building? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Of those, it was four per building. Mm -hmm. and of those four per building, are any of those sites tested again that were coming up high before, or were they visited from another part of the building? The, um, the samples, we talked about that, but I don't remember what the answer was. Like the, the 20 samples this time, the same? Yeah, they're exactly the same points. Same points. But in addition, we replaced pulses with the session. Anywhere where there's roll valve within that sink or faucet, we can bring out the sink. Anything else on the uh, Chester? So, since we met last time, uh, the Chester County Health Department has been back uh, to do uh, their COVID 19 in uh, building inspection. Uh, Last time we met, they had done uh, the PLC, the elementary school in LIS. Um, so this time they did the high school and then the junior high. So um, I handed those out uh, that should be replaced there, the results for each of those. Um, so everything was good according to the Chester County Health Department. So as of now, they've been into every one of our schools. They've looked at what we've done for social distancing. Uh, they've looked at 
the, the signage that we have about using uh, a, a six feet and wearing a mask. They looked at uh, uh, buildings with kids in them to see that they are socially distant as much as you can do that. Um, they also looked at um, the chemicals we're using for disinfecting. They looked at ventilation in the buildings. Uh, the availability of quarantine room in each building. And then again, the face covering and social distancing. So um, it looks like uh, it looks like we're good. We are looking at one other thing right now. Um, there are HEPA filter um, devices that, that we are getting our hands on. That's like maybe one extra layer for some areas that, that might need it for some individuals that might need it to, you know, help them in their own. Other than that, I think we're in good shape. Any questions about the COVID cleaning or disinfecting? So on the uh, agenda for next week for the school board meeting, we will have uh, a, an individual that we are recommending for the open custodial position. So we're moving on that. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up on that. And this individual has been here uh, working for us for the last few years uh, as an interstate employee. Uh, so uh, he was our top candidate. And he will uh, he's happy to accept the position should we formally offer it him and he's excited he'll stay down he's down at the OIS building now he'll stay down there then what we'll do is interstate we'll try to replace the daytime custodial position up here at the junior high so we will have a lot to say about you know uh, candidates that they bring in of course they have to uh, pass all our judgment Okay, I was hoping to have some information on a couple of high school roof repairs that need to be done uh, between or, or now. Uh, however, WTI, the company that holds our uh, roof warranties, they've been hit hard by COVID. So they've been uh, unavailable for the past uh, few weeks. So unfortunately, I don't have any quotes to get those few items done. Uh, for the high school. And that also kind of is holding me up. I wanted to uh, get our 10 year plan updated, including roof work that we'll need to get done this summer and, and the next few years out. Uh, so they have not been able to come in and meet with me and give me uh, an updated schedule on that. But uh, I think it's been a couple of weeks now, so hopefully they'll be able to get back on track and get back out here and uh, deal with those few items we have at the high school. And then help us update Okay, so under other, uh, I wanted to give you a, an update on our camera and access control system. So, if you recall last spring and over the summer, we've been working on a new camera system and access control system. Um, Rob and his team with help from uh, our security company and all the principals, they whittled it down to a system uh, at Vigilon, and that's the name of the company that makes the camera systems. We put that out to three different vendors who said they would give us a quote on, and they would quote us using either a PEPCOM or a CoStar's contract, a state contract. So we didn't have to actually do a large public bid, we did it through a state established bid already. Uh, we've gotten one back uh, so far. We reached out to a second one, second company saying, we really want to get your quote in this week. We really want to you know, make a decision on, on this. Um, so we're waiting for the second bid. The third company backed out only because they want they didn't want to use the system that we had asked them to. And we didn't want to get in a situation where, okay, we just put in this brand new um, IT infrastructure and that they want to use a different type of server and stuff that wouldn't necessarily be completely compatible with our system. So we're going to have two different quotes. 
Um, in the meantime, and I, you know, I'm hoping to get some help maybe from Tony and anyone else, the visual on would like to give us a, um, uh, a Zoom presentation on the coverage, the types of cameras, the data storage and all that. Um, I can set up the meeting uh, and, and I think Tony, you're happy to help us out with that. Sure. I hate to ask for one more thing, but if you are, and anyone else who uh, would like to do that, if, um, if, if I can get you anyone else to sit in on a Zoom, uh, hear a presentation from the Vigilon, and then hopefully Rob and I will have the other quote. We can start doing the due diligence on the quotes and bring to you guys um, what the proposal is. So, can do the as well. so other than Tony, are there any other board members that would go? Uh, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? Um, Whenever you're available, I can try to coordinate it when it works for you or whoever it is. Is that a yes or a no? Yeah, I said I wouldn't mind. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, so Tony, Brian, and anyone else. So maybe what I'll do is I'll coordinate with you two, and then we can throw it out there, and I can get a link to anyone else. So um, we'll have uh, uh, Danny, our security officer who's been involved in this from the get-go. He, of course, will be on um, the meeting, and then uh, Rob Devery and these uh, other people from his staff will be on it. So you, you can ask them lots of questions about the coverage, the type of hardware, uh, pick it apart. Um, we can certainly adjust anything uh, that comes uh, through these meetings, but uh, um, I'm hoping by, again, like like I said, by the end of this week, we'll have gotten the quotes that we're going to get so we can start making comparisons and make a recommendation. Um, if you've driven by the PLC recently, you'll see that there's a big storage uh, container kind of in front of the building. <laughs> That's actually going to be moved around to the side of the building. So it just it was a lot easier to fill it up there, but after seeing how intrusive it was, we asked that contractor to move it around to the back. So that'll happen tomorrow or tomorrow. Okay. That'll happen tomorrow. Is it full now? It is not full. Now. <laughs> much easier or much harder to do. To move. Yeah, I don't know if they would move it. Uh, that's all I had on the agenda. Are there any? I know there was a short period of time between our two meetings and I pushed to get the water results in. <laughs> but at least I had to talk about it. Not a whole lot else in the last few years. We start a policy at 5 30 because we just never know. I know. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming he's coming in person, but he doesn't always come. Uh, Sam is coming here before seven if you're talking about three. Yeah, he's coming right here. And he's coming in person? Yeah. So we need to adjourn for half an hour? Yeah, yeah. Take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break.